In terms of uh, global equities uh, for the coming year, um, it's an interesting story. And as we said, this is, this is a, a time to be selective in your equities. Um, the policy uh, supportiveness of the Fed and the Treasury, and by the way, that's all over the world. Governments all over the world are being equally accommodative, really does support uh, higher equity prices as the economy recovers. But we do think that's going to be fragmented. So again, as we, as we review reasons why the market's going to go higher, negative interest rates, interest rates are very low. Lower the interest rates, higher the multiple on the markets. We have the, the massive stimulus and we have the vaccines. Um, fiscal stimulus uh, has been used globally, as, as we mentioned. These are the numbers, uh, percentage of GDP stimulus we've seen in the marketplace. And, and it's, it's not just the US, Japan, Canada, Australia, all even more stimulus than the US. So this is a worldwide uh, flow of money into the system uh, that, again, should be bullish. Um, we said vaccines were a game changer. And what this next chart shows is the change in earnings expectation over the last two months when the vaccine was announced. And again, the U.S. is actually at the back end of this. It's international stocks that are showing the largest estimate recovery for earnings. And that's why we actually favor international markets right now. We're overweight international markets. We think they have the biggest ability to bounce. And speaking of Europe, not only do you have the recovery of the vaccine, lower valuations to start, higher earnings recovery rates, but we're also finally resolving Brexit. And our base case was when it came down to the moment that both parties have too much to lose not to cut a deal. And although there was a lot of drama and that was compounded because of COVID, at the end of the day, they made a deal and that's starting to free up Europe once again. Um, International, we think, is going to benefit more than the U.S. Um, one of the other reasons, exports. Uh, the U.S. is a big importer of goods, and so the high export countries uh, should do well. Again, as, the, as China recovers, as the U.S. recovers, as Europe recovers, these are the big consumers of goods. These export countries are going to do well re-establishing these global spending economies. And as you can see here, the higher export countries listed here, Thailand, Germany, South Korea, Mexico, so forth. So international markets, we think, are going to favor, uh, be favored in terms of that, that point. Um, also, it's time to narrow the gap. We are always, always talking about valuation. Put money where valuation is inexpensive. You want to buy sunglasses on a rainy day and umbrellas on a sunny day. And so right now, the whole world is chasing the hot dots. They're chasing those few stocks, and they're paying any price for those names. And international stocks have largely been ignored. But it's a cycle. International stocks get cheap. I think back at times where I heard, you know, the U.S. will never grow. It's a terrible place to put money because we're too big, and you have to have money in the international markets. And then they fall out of favor, and then the U.S. is the only place. And this goes back and forth, back and forth. And we can see in this chart periods where international outperform the U.S., it goes on for a stretch, and they switch back and forth. Well, we've been in a long stretch of U.S. outperformance. Valuations have, have reached record, record levels of valuation differences. And so it's time, we think, for the international to slowly start working its way back up and having its time um, to outperform. In terms of global equities, international developed equities, um, they tend to benefit from a weak dollar. We have a weak dollar. That also see, tends to be good for them. In terms of the U.S., um, I don't want to seem like we don't like the U.S. markets. We do. The economy will be very strong, we think, in the second half of this year. But again, it's where you put the money. Value over growth, we think, is one of the smartest plays this year and going forward for the next cycle. Again, we are at record valuation gaps because of this, this very narrow thrust in these big uh, growth names. So this next chart shows you um, taking the Russell 1000 growth minus the Russell 1000 value, and it has now reached all-time highs, again, higher than we saw back in the early 2000s. That says that we're getting to an extreme. When we're at extreme, we want to take money out of the top side of an extreme and put it into the value side of the extreme. Um, large cap growth also, by the way, typically lags after a recession. It makes sense. When you're going in a recession, everybody runs to the high quality, big growth name, 
And when you come out, that's when things like financials and industrials and commodities and energy, they tend to do well as, this, as the economy picks back up. So this historically is what happens after a recession. You can see small cap, small cap value, small cap growth, large cap value, they tend to outperform. And by the way, I keep mentioning 1999. In 1999, small cap value was the big winner. Large cap growth had three really tough years. One last point on this valuation gap. This is a hard moment. Um, when you reach these extremes, the stories are so extraordinary and, and they're so compelling and they seem perfect. And that's why stocks reach very, very high levels because the story is perfect. And it seems almost unimaginable that these stocks have a problem. I hear it all the time today, but these are great companies, but it's different, but they're real businesses, but these are excellent. And I look back at 1999 and I heard the same stories. Cisco was a great company. Microsoft, Dell, Amazon, all amazing companies. And what's interesting is all the stories they told in 1999 came true. The internet has become everything they thought it was going to be and more. And those companies achieved success that we've never seen in the corporate US world or anywhere else in history. So it happened, it worked, but the NASDAQ went down 80%. Cisco, one of the greatest companies in history, went from 90 to 9. We have to remember, you have to disassociate story from price. Price can get too high. Now, I'm not predicting an 80% drop, but what I am saying is valuations are getting stretched, and we're very much hearing the same stories we did in 1999. And yes, there is speculation in the market. Look at Bitcoin. Look at the SPACs, special purpose acquisition companies that are bringing companies to market with no revenue, without any earnings, or even sales, just a business plan. That's 1999. And so the risk is rising, the valuation gaps are widening, and the question is, are you trying to chase the last bit of return, or should we be smart, should we be disciplined, stick to the allocation? But more importantly, in 2000, 2001, while the NASDAQ was falling double digits each year, small cap value went up, large cap value went up. It is possible to make money in that environment because the extreme on one side creates an extreme on the other. And when those extremes are, are, are fixed, both sides move. So keep that in mind. I know, and, and, and one last point on this, you never know how far it's going to go. It goes far beyond you, any expectation you might have for it. And the market, there's an old saying, the market could be wrong longer than you can stay liquid. So this can go on and on. But what we know is at the end, in the long run, the market always returns to its pure fundamentals. And that's how much cash flow am I delivering as a business? It's not about who's the next person in line behind me to buy my stock at a higher price. So we want to make sure that we're, we're focused on putting money where there's good valuation. That's at the end of the day, the story of 2021 in terms of the stock market.